Hey guys, welcome into Conifer Community Church. My name, as always, if you've been an online person with us for a while, is Wesley Humes. I'm the Associate Pastor of Youth and Connections. And I would love to connect with you. So if it's your first time, fill out that Connect card. There's gonna be a link in the chat below. Fill that out and I would love to reach out to you to say, hey, let's grab coffee. We are a church that believes in connection and community and that's what you can have too. So come be a part of our in-person worship service. We'd love to have you there. But if you need to stay home or you're off traveling, we are so glad that you chose to be with us. There's plenty other options, but you chose to be here with us. So thank you. Now, as we get into our sermon series, we're talking about what does the Bible say about? This is an open-ended question. We've gone through many other series. So if you want to check those out, go watch our past weeks. We've talked about many hot button things, but right now we are going through what does the Bible say about the end times? What does it say about the afterlife? What does it say about everything in that revelation type of place? What does it say about heaven? What does it say about hell? And so Pastor Lance is going to lead us in that. Uh, Pastor Tim is also going to be up here leading us in worship. So we're really excited for you to be a part of this. So fill out that connect card, throw a prayer request down, and we would love for you to participate in worship with us. Thanks. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. Thank you. 
Hey guys, welcome into Morning, Conifer everyone. Community Church. My name, as always, Everybody if you've been an online person with us for a while, is Wesley Hughes, the you associate pastor of minutes. Youth and Connections. And I would love to connect with you. So if it's anyway, while uh, while you're eating, if you haven't eaten, go ahead and eat. Get out there. But this stuff isn't that important. <laughs> but if you haven't already, uh, go ahead and grab one of these connection cards and fill that out. Um, if you have any prayer requests or questions about what's going on in the church, you can put that on this card. Also, there's a little QR code that you can click on that'll take you to our worship guide, which has all the words to the songs that we're going to sing. And um, You know the rest. Um, we've got a new song we're going to start with called Evidence. And... Um, so I've been going through some issues the last month. Um, had health issues with bad cold. I've got a bad ankle. Um, my my dad's in the, the hospital, and um, he's iffy, um, but he can't walk right now. So it's been a it's been a lot of stress on my mom. So I've been trying to comfort her. And, get her through this hopefully he's coming home tomorrow um, which is kind of a I think it's going to be the last so we're, we're preparing for the end and it's it's a tough thing to accept especially when it's when you're not sure but um, through all that we have evidence that God is good and that he is in control and he knows what's going on. There's a scripture in Romans, it's Romans uh, one twenty. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. So we're without excuse even if you haven't heard the good news, God's put his evidence that he is in control, that he is the creator of the world, and uh, we need to follow him. So let's uh, stand as we remember that as we sing this next song. It's called Evidence. Throughout my history, your faithfulness has walked beside me. The winter storms made way for spring. And every season, from where I'm standing, I see the evidence of your goodness.
<laughs> so uh, I had left this on, just stuck it in my pocket, and my wife's home watching the live stream. She said, your lav mic's on. It's coming over the live stream. So I turned it off. I guess I forgot. Anyway, uh, my name's Josh Harwood, one of your elders here. Um, I wanted to, to share with you out of, out of John 15, this is... Jesus talking to his disciples, um, you know, the, the night essentially before he's betrayed, before they head off to the, to the Last Supper. In John 15, verse 14, he says this. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. I just think it's, it's so very special that we have the opportunity to know the business of the father and, and to be called to participate in it. And regardless of the distractions that we have or the challenges that come in and out of our life, we can always get down on our knees and say, Father, forgive me, pull me back in to what you had for me and help me to find my way in you again. And that's part of what communion is about. It's that opportunity to just refocus and recenter ourselves on God's calling for our lives and to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross so that we could have access to that calling and have eternal life. So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that's broken for you. Take and eat.
And in the same way, he took a cup and he gave thanks and he said, this is the blood of a new covenant that's poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father God, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have through the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, may we never forget that sacrifice. Lord, may we never take for granted your grace and your forgiveness. Father, help us to find ourselves not in the distractions of this world and not in our possessions, but Lord, in your calling. Father, keep us focused on what you would have for us each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, you're dismissed. Miss Amy's in the back. She's waiting on you. Let's go ahead and stand again. We're going to sing a It Is Well, very familiar chorus.
God, we thank you that you can give us peace. And know that it is well. Through the tough and troublesome times and through the, the wonderful times, we can know all is well because you are in charge and will always be there for us. It's in your name that we do pray. Amen. Well, good to see everybody here this morning. Welcome to Conifer Community Church. We got uh, great things going on now. Hopefully you guys had a chance to get up and get some breakfast. You guys have some breakfast here, a few of you. And uh, we appreciate it. I know that there's several up there in overflow now enjoying that. And for those who are online, know that we have that um, breakfast happening each Sunday morning now. And so um, I want to encourage you guys to participate in that and enjoy that. And uh, if you are up in overflow now, give big round of applause for all those who may be here too. If you enjoyed that breakfast and thank them for getting that back together. <laughs> Excited to have that um, here coming up through the holiday season. And so we'll um, have that provided if you want to invite friends and you can enjoy um, breakfast and have worship time up in the overflow room or get here early, have breakfast and, and come in and, and worship together with us here. Well, this morning we are um, continuing a series kind of in the last phase of the What Does the Bible Say About series. We've been going through that for quite some time now and, and kind of added some little mini series things um, into that. And they have come directly out of the questions that, that uh, you all have filled out in, um, on the cards. And so on those connection cards that we have. And uh, on there, just ask the question, what do you want to know what the Bible has to say about things? And so this last mini-series is on um, human sexuality. There were several questions on that, and then a lot of questions just in discussion. I had a class back in um, April, May, where we um, just talked about responding to tough cultural issues. And um, as I let the class kind of guide what we were going to talk about, that's what it ended up being. And on um, so many difficult issues, surrounding sexuality in today's world. And um, so, yeah, we just want to take a look and see what the Bible has to say about the things that are happening in our world and the way that we are processing even the things that happen in our own lives. And last week we began with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and just talked about how God has made us um, as his temple. And, and so in that, we have the presence of God with us, and, and he gave, Paul gave that in the context of looking at and evaluating our lives um, and, and sexuality. And so looking at that, uh, many of us have um, backgrounds and pasts that are, that are difficult, that are challenging, and the way that we finished last week was we should have a distinctive view on sexuality as Christians, and, and there should be... Um, a look at God's design over um, sexuality in order for us to understand how we process the things that, that we go through and the things that we participate in and, and how we navigate that world um, around us. So having that distinctive Christian view, I want to help us develop that over the next few weeks. Um, but then also an, a place that we finished last week was um, just kind of evaluating. I know that, you know, in a group um, this size and those who are watching online, those who are in overflow, um, different things that happen to us um, sexually over our lifetime, many times we are in isolation around those things. We live with a sense of guilt and shame and we, we live with a sense of being in isolation. It's almost like we don't have anybody that we can talk to about um, these issues. Um, could be over bad decisions or mistakes that we've made regarding our own sexuality. Um, it could be something that, that we experience like anger 
and, and shame and maybe even unworthiness over something that has happened to us. You know, many times in, in abusive situations and, and difficulties with, um, with regards to rape and, and those types of things, it's, it's, uh, those are things that, that sometimes they happen and you have the trauma in your life and you never really talk about it and process it. And you wonder, you know, how do I, how do I make it through? How do I survive? Um, this type of situation. And so a lot of inner turmoil that comes up. Also, um, for us as a, as a group, um, there's probably some confusion and displacement and anger um, over violation that happens around us. So maybe if it's not something that we had made bad decisions or had happened to us, maybe others around us that we know of that are close to us struggle um, in these particular ways, and we just don't know how to respond. We don't know what um, to do in reaction um, or response to those different things. And, and many times around this area of sexuality um, in the church, there is judgment that is cast. There is, um, you know, the, the things that happen in, in terms of um, divorce or um, just, you know, kind of life stuff that takes place and, and decisions that we make and, and even um, situations that we have to live through and hard decisions that we have to make. Many times um, the church can, instead of turning in grace to one another and helping support one another, many times we turn in judgment towards one another. And, um, you know, a lot of times it's because we don't understand what people are going through. I think a lot of that comes to some of the contemporary issues that we're dealing with today around, around the gender identity stuff. You know, a lot of that we, we, I hear in, um, I, I would say, Christian or church circles, I hear a lot of judgment cast in that way. And a lot of it is just out of a lack of understanding. It's a, it's a reaction. It's a um, kind of a judgmental reaction um, because we don't know how to process some of the things and, and they're new challenges that we have that are going on in our lives um, and, and in the lives around us. And so with all of those things taking place, um, I, I think what God wants to do is he wants to repurpose our hearts. He wants to take any of those situations that we may have found ourselves in to this point and, and take those emotional reactions that we have and then frame them in what, um, what he would do, what, how he would respond. And we as the church should then, um, in turn, reflect his character as well, whether we need to seek um, forgiveness in some areas, whether we need to um, resolve some issues, begin to look at others around us in through different lenses, um, we need to see god 's approach as we frame our response to sexuality and in order to start doing that and kind of taking that next step, we have a distinctive view of god 's design, and I think we 're probably going to get to that next week where we where we kind of frame that in a little bit more. Um, But this week, I want us just to deal with the way that we have responded um, in in terms of reactions to different things that we've seen in the news or things that friends have gone through, whatever um, those things may be. Um, I want us to look at our own response and our own approach to um, these issues. In order to do that, I think if we go back to... um, the garden, and we begin to look at some of God's story throughout Scripture, I think we begin to see a a thread of how God has responded to the violations to his design over the course of all of history, and how uh, many have resolved those issues throughout time, and then we're going to end, or we're going to move um, pretty quickly to the story um, that will be familiar of um, Jesus meeting the woman at the well. And um, in that, he confronts um, a very difficult sexual issue with, with her. Um, and the way that he approaches that and the way that God has approached things, I think, gives us a picture of how we should respond, whether it's to our own heart and our own guilt or those that are around us. As we look at God's approach, um, I think the best term that we can use in, in order to see how God uh, approaches us um, as we have violated his design, um, particularly in, in the area of sexuality, is uh, the best way to frame it is in, in terms of redemption. 
Um, if you think about, you know, God setting Adam and Eve into the garden, and as he set them and said, do not take of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one, the one thing, you know, you have one job, don't violate this standard, and then what do they do? They go and violate that standard, and his response to that as it has worked out throughout history, I think gives us the big picture of how we should respond to these difficult things. And, and I would frame it as in terms of redemption. Because the way that he responded, it was, he said, the result, you know, the, the judgment from violating this standard is going to be death. And so from the point that they violated his standard, that was the kind of the the um, institution of death that came into the world. And, and you look at it in terms of spiritual death, separation from God. There was those things that happened. And as, jo- as God dealt with Adam and Eve, he dealt in a redemptive way, basically saying, well, I promise to make this right, to set things back, to repurpose humanity in terms of, of the grace that I have and the design that I have placed on you to restore the image that has been broken because of the violation that has taken place. And so through scripture, we see God acting in a gracious and, and redeeming way over the course of time in all of the different violations, even in the laws that, that he gives um, as we um, go through the book of Leviticus, and, and those laws are not absolute correctives to the violations of things that have taken place. They are redemptive corrections that, you know, it's, it's like looking at life and saying, okay, what is my best next step right now? What is, what is the best next thing that I can do in light of a situation that has gone very, very wrong? And so um, even in the law, God is showing redemptive steps, trying to bring his people along um, to make us look a little bit more like him, to see the, um, the image restored in our hearts and lives. Looking and seeing his uh, redemptive approach, we could look at many stories in terms of um, God's design for sexuality being violated throughout Scripture. Um, but I think the story that um, helps us frame it in, and, and something I think that we can identify even with the woman who comes to the well in, in so many different areas, I think this particular story um, gives us a picture of how we should maybe begin to approach. And so no matter where you find yourself on that above list that I gave, you know, whether it's something that you have done, something that has been done to you, to those around you, or something that you just see happening around you, I think this story gives us um, a bit of framing on how we should respond. And so we're going to look at John chapter 4 and Jesus' approach. John Piper um, writes this um, around this story and around the way that Jesus approached people um, that were in violation of his design or that maybe even society had, been, had put them as an outcast um, or they had felt in isolation. Um, John Piper writes this. He says, the quickest way to the heart Jesus sees is through a wound. And that's what we find in many of these cases re- regarding sexuality in our own experience. Many times we find ourselves in a wounded position. And if we allow God to come into that, to begin to heal that from within, we can then begin to see how we approach things as well. But I thought, you know, that uh, the way that he framed that, the quickest way to the heart was through a wound. And so for the gospel to be effective in our hearts, Um, He comes in through these places that we feel that guilt and shame and confusion and and difficulty and challenge around these areas. So let's take a look at what is taking place with um, Jesus. Uh, Basically, the disciples had gone into town. Jesus is traveling through Samaria, which is an interesting thing for him to do. Uh, in in light of their cultural situation, for um, the Jewish people to travel through Samaria was a very unusual thing. They would travel miles out of their way in order to avoid the Samaritan people um, because they had set them as ones who were unclean, who were um, violators of God's law. You know, there was a lot of judgment that was cast from the Jewish people to the Samaritan people, um, even though they 
were connected in some ways in, in some of their bloodline. And so they had, in, the, in this isolation that was already taking place, Jesus took the, the unusual route of going straight through Samaria. He did the unexpected, which is what he usually does, and probably maybe our first clue as to how we should respond is look at the way that we naturally respond and maybe look at what the unexpected response would particularly be. And so he's moving through Samaria, and his disciples had gone into town to um, get some food and, and get some nourishment, and so he finds himself in this historic place at Jacob's Well, and enters the woman and the conversation that had taken place there. So beginning here in um, verse 1, I'll just give you some of this framing. It says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard um, that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, that is John the Baptist, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, um, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, so headed from um, the southern part to the northern part. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to the town in Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, um, wearied as he was from the journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So it would have been like lunchtime, noon hour, um, was when they found themselves just tired in the heat of the day. It says, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, um, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now, this interaction is is important culturally and and helps us even look at how we should respond to some of these issues um, from the very beginning. Because as I mentioned before, the Samaritans were um, kind of the outcasts among the Jewish people. They had been isolated in this area, and the Jews would avoid them. Now, common practice would have been for the ladies to travel together, to go in groups, to be able to um, get to the well, to gain the water, and bring it back for um, the village or their families um, that were there. And so the fact that this woman shows up at the noon hour, she shows up alone, she is a um, Samaritan woman, this is... um, it's just an unusual situation that there are, there are some things happening here where she feels isolated. She feels isolated from her people even that are isolated from the Jewish people. And, and, and so instead of traveling with the other ladies, she is somehow even more isolated on the outside than, um, than even being a Samaritan. And so when Jesus says to her, give me a drink, he's violating all sorts of social standards that they would have had in their time. And so when he says, give her a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So, you know, some of that context that that builds in that this is, she's caught off guard. You know, why, why exactly are you talking to me? Why are you asking me for water? And Jesus turns it around being who Jesus is. And he says, he answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And this woman said to him, and, and you know, just taking him at kind of his literal word, like, what are you talking about, living water? He um, says, sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? And then she says, are you greater than our father, Jacob? He gave this well to us and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty Again, but whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I give will become in him a spring of water welling up in eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have, come, or have to come here to draw water. You hear in, in her response this just kind of literalistic response of where, what is this living water that you're talking about? Why are you talking to me? There's a lot of confusion uh, as to the discussion of what is going on. 
But what we're about to find out in, in her story is the reason why she is so isolated is because um, she has become, she's divorced several times over. She um, is even, I guess, an outcast among her own people. And, and so in this, it would have been expected not only that she would have been an outcast to Jesus as a Jewish man, but that even more so an outcast because of the adultery that she had been a part of. But what she sees from Jesus is an offer for this living water. And, and I think that's the place where we find ourselves in a wounded position um, in, in regards to uh, sexuality, whether it is what we have done, what others have done to us, um, or things around us. We see the, that God's design has been derailed and it has, has been moved. And so the search is, how do we find relief? How do we find relief from the guilt? How do we find relief from the shame? How do we find clarity for what is next? And how do we find a peace a peace that only God can give us in our hearts. And that's what Jesus is offering. That's what the offer that that we begin with, the offer of the gospel is that we can find peace, peace even in the midst of the violations that have happened in our lives, whether they be in a sexual realm or anything else um, related to God's moral standard. We can find grace and we can find peace in the person of Christ. And so what he offers to begin with is grace and love and acceptance to this woman who has violated these standards. I think that's our first clue. Maybe we need to look at ourselves and say, I need to, I need to just rely on God's grace in order to find that forgiveness in my heart for myself. I need to rely on God's grace for the forgiveness of others that are around me. I need to rely on God's grace and extend his grace to those who are around me rather than simply jumping to judgment, which is what she anticipated, which we many times jump to in in our way of dealing with these types of issues. But looking at grace rather than judgment as our general posture. Well, he carries on, he confronts what is going on here with this woman, and it connects to a a deep part of her heart because he then invites her into a time of worship and and a, a place of worship that she could join with her heavenly father. And many times in um, these violated or isolated situations, we feel like not only do we have trouble with those in relation to us around us, but we also feel uh, a violation of our relationship with the one who has created us as well. And so he continues on and, and, and Jesus says to her, he says, go call your husband and have him come here. And the woman answered, I have no husband. And Jesus answered her. And this is where he kind of shows his hand a little bit of of this is who he is. He's someone different than all of the rest of the Jews around, than anyone else around really as um, the one who is the Messiah who had come. You are right in saying that you have no husband. For you you have had five husbands, and the one that you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So faced with this wound that he basically kind of exposes to her, and she's well aware of it. She's well aware of her isolation and her separation from her people and also from God. In light of that wound, 
that he exposes, he offers the solution which is in God's grace. He says, you feel isolated and you feel alone. You feel that you have been separated and cast out from all of those around you. You don't even feel that you can come to a place that you can worship the God who has created you. And what Jesus does is he, he speaks healing into that wound in that very moment through his grace. He says, here is your situation. We're not going to skirt around the reality of what situation you have found yourself in. We're not going to get around that at all, but you have to know that even in light of the ways in which violation has happened, you can still come and worship together. I think that is a message that we need to hear uh, before we get into even more of the controversial areas around sexuality in our world today. Um, because many times when I'm faced with some of the um, bigger struggles that people will bring up within homosexuality, within gender identity issues, what the message has been from the church is a message of outcast and judgment. It is that, oh, you Samaritan people, we're not going to mix with you at all. And, and that becomes kind of a dividing line between the church and and the rest of the world that is struggling um, with very, very deep issues, just as we are struggling here with very deep issues. And what we need to offer as the church is we need to offer a place of grace, a place of love, a place of hope, where we are not pointing them towards becoming just simply morally right people, but we are falling on the grace of God because we realize none of us is right in the face of God. And what we are relying on as his people is that he is the one who will provide the living water that we need to sustain us, that we're all coming to the same well, that we're all drinking of the same water, and that we can find community together in love and grace. He offers that to her. He says, you don't even think you can go to worship in Jerusalem because the Jews and Samaritans don't mix. But he's saying there's a time that is coming because Jesus is here. There's a time that is coming that you will be welcome to worship because God is not a location. God is spirit. God is, is of all truth and grace and he invites all of us who are seeking him to worship. Because I think something even more important here is that not just those who are seeking him, but he is out seeking those who are broken, who are wounded. And so many times in, in our violation and, and our place of feeling isolated, we feel like no one is coming after us. And I think from this story, we can see Jesus is pursuing each of us with his love and his grace. And we, as his church, need to reflect in that. So then we see some of the reaction that happens in the next part of this story. It says, The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, and he was called the Christ. Um, when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. So he shows his hand and says, I'm, I'm that Messiah. You're finding grace. You're finding a place where you can worship. You can be joined with the Father through me. Um, and, and, and so he's, he's offering this. But then you see the reaction. And this is where, you know, many times the church's reaction is, is the inappropriate reaction to all of the difficulties and brokenness that we see in the world around us, particularly in the areas of sexuality. It says, just then his disciples came back, and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no, one, uh, but no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking to her? So the woman left her, jar, her water jar, went away into the town, and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did, and can this be the Christ? And they went out from the town, and they were um, coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, how, does anyone, how has anyone brought him something to eat? 
And Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. To do, uh, do you not say there are um, four months and then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is, is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. So he's saying this, this food that I'm, that I'm showing you, the harvest that is there, is in the people that you feel are not worthy. The, the harvest and, and the grace is extended out to those who you stand in judgment over and, and, and who you are pushing away. And God is saying we need to bring all of God's people together. We need, to, we need to extend this grace and this love, not look in isolation, in isolation and in judgment, but such a difficult thing for us to do as God's people because we feel like we have that higher moral ground because we feel like, oh, I don't struggle in this area so I can act in judgment towards someone else. But then the struggles are very deep and very real for all who struggle in this particular area. I think we see the response that we should have. I think we see the areas in which we should extend God's grace and his forgiveness to others. But there are also places that I think that we struggle, um, particularly in the areas of rape and abuse, where, where we become a victim, we become isolated, and you know she she had actively participated in what was taking place around her and her situation but then there are those situations where where we become the victims of bad things that other people do and we struggle with anger we struggle with judgment we struggle um, with confusion and and wondering what to do and how to process that and so in looking in light of the grace that Jesus offered to this woman, how do we then process some of those things that happen to us then as well? I think many times in those situations we harbor um, a feeling of unforgiveness because of the violations that have taken place. And so for that, I think extending grace is still the place where God would, would send us even in light of all of the anger and, and all of the hatred that maybe even comes out of those situations, offering forgiveness is the place where God would drive us to go. I see that in uh, Matthew chapter 6. As he gives the Lord's Prayer and, and he's teaching um, his disciples and, and those around them how to pray, um, he speaks in terms of, he's not speaking about sexuality in particular for this, but he's speaking in terms of violation and forgiving others who have wronged you, which this would fall under. He goes through and he gives the Lord's Prayer, which we, um, we say together in, in light of communion many times over throughout the year. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. So he drives in on forgiveness a little bit right there. So that, that should be a posture that we take. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But the follow-up verses, I think, are the ones that are probably the most important for us when we feel violated, when we feel that anger and the hatred towards things that have happened to us. And, and here's what he says. He says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive yours. A heart of forgiveness and grace is, is the deepest place of where healing can happen. Because many times what happens in response, in anger response and hatred response, because of violation, they're justified, um, justified emotional reactions to bad things that happen to people. Um, the place where he drives us is we have to offer and, and find ourselves in a place where we can extend forgiveness to those people that have violated us. If we don't, then that extension of forgiveness from God is somehow blocked in the way that we block it toward 
others. In order for us to receive and feel the grace of God, we have to extend that even to others. Such a hard concept for us um, to understand, appreciate, to embrace because of many times what the violation is. But think of it in terms of this. Whenever there is anger and hatred towards others for what they have done to us, that anger and hatred over time becomes a controlling factor where they have control over our hearts rather than God having the control and reign as Lord of our lives. When we do not forgive others, we have given control of our own hearts and lives to those to the, to, who, who we are extending the anger towards rather than allowing God's lordship to be reigning in our hearts and our lives. So this may apply to the area of sexuality, but it may apply to other areas where you feel violated in life. You feel angry about those who have treated you poorly, a parent that didn't raise you well, who abused you. There is so many different ways in which we can, we can apply this particular um, concept and, and, and idea of forgiveness. And maybe in our hearts, we need to begin by forgiving those who have even violated us. All of those together are a picture of the redemption that God extends to us. He offers us a part in his family. He offers us adoption into his heavenly family. And he looks at us, and just as Jesus was looking at that woman at the well and all of those that she brought back with him and, and saying, this, this man knows everything that I've done. All the wounds are exposed, and the healing is offered there. And he just, with open arms, offers his grace and says, yes, come to me, my child. I think that's the message that we need to receive as we talk even further about some of the struggles that are there. And I hope that maybe even today you can take one redemptive step, whether it's something you have done looking for forgiveness from God or others, or something that has happened to you that you need to offer forgiveness to others. Taking one redemptive step in grace, maybe today is the day that you would do that. But I want to give you this picture um, in, in conclusion for you to process all of what you may be experiencing right now. Tony Campolo's told a story one time of, of uh, a flight that he took um, from one place to another. I can't remember the destination he was going. But he saw this little girl that was so excited about going to see her daddy. And she was jumping around the airport and so excited and she was eating a lot of sweets and just like amping up, ramping up for, for this reunion that she would have with her father down um, the road or on the other side. And as she just got more and more excited, they hit the runway and they took off and they hit some turbulence along the way. And she was, oh, I'm going to see daddy, I'm going to see daddy. And that turbulence just kept bouncing and bouncing. And all of a sudden, all of what that sugar and everything that got on the inside came to the outside. And so she just covered and getting more and more excited about things, just covered in, in her own regurgitation of all the wonderful sweet things that she had had over um, the course of the last little time. She was just so excited. And Tony Campolo says, you know, he, they're getting close. They're pulling in, taxing in. They're getting ready to go out. And this is where you can meet people. This is back in the day when you could meet people at the gate, right? And, and he said, I am going to get out of here quick so that I can watch. I want to see what happens. <laughs> How is daddy going to respond to vomit girl, right? <laughs> and, so, and so he goes out and, and he says he just watches. And she comes and, and she's just so excited. And she is just caked and all of the nastiness and everything that is there. And he sees her just running down the runway. I'm going to see daddy. I'm going to see daddy. And he sees the dad like emerge out of the side and just with open arms, she jumps and he just grabs her up and he says, oh, my little girl. And he just swings her around and it didn't matter what she had on her. 
It didn't matter because that reunion was going to be sweet. I think that's the picture we need to carry in light of those difficulties that happen to us. The, the dirtiness that we feel because of sexual things that have happened in our past. Whether we have done them or they have been done to us, they have been done to others around us, we need to realize that picture that God is welcoming us in as his children. As we are turning to him and he is coming and pursuing us and he's saying there is a time where we can worship in spirit and truth. We don't have to worry about all of those things that weigh heavy on us. We can offer those, we can find forgiveness, we can find grace, and we need to be able to find that within the body of Christ together. That's the picture that we need. All of us are coming into church every single week like that little girl is coming off the plane. We all are caked in the, the results of all the things that we have participated in for the week. And we need to see God receive us. The worship that we sing and, and say to him and the reading of his scripture allow that to wash over us so that we can stand before one another and before God and be a pleasing child in his sight. I want to invite you to bow your heads. This morning as we've walked through um, all of those scenarios and you know, maybe it has triggered some things that have happened before in your life, some things that you have done, some things that have been done to you, some places that you wish that you hadn't found yourself in life, some forgiveness that you need to extend towards others. Maybe just take that one redemptive step right now and offer that in the quiet, quietness and isolation of your own heart right now. Offer that to him with open hands before him and say, God, here am I, as dirty as I can be, and I need your grace and your peace. Maybe you need to extend that towards others. Maybe your prayer needs to be, I need to find forgiveness for someone who has done something to me. And you begin right now and you say, God, help me find forgiveness in my heart because I want your forgiveness as well. And let us sing and worship as his children today. God, we pray that in wherever we find ourselves right now, God, if we find ourselves full of guilt and of shame, find ourselves full of anger, find ourselves feeling isolated, or maybe even just feeling judgmental towards others. God, whatever that place may be, I pray that you would replace those things with your grace and your peace. Lord, let us embrace our position with you as your child. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up for God, I am free. darkness flees, the you my heart screams, I am free.
You guys be seated just for a second. Uh, I want to go through just a couple of things that we have in the life of the church. One, we've mentioned before, Overflow Cafe. You guys um, come early. 8.30 is when we start breakfast on Sunday mornings and goes through about the time of communion right around when the sermon starts. And so invite friends to join you for breakfast on, on these Sunday mornings as we get into the holiday season. And uh, we'll just continue to see that um, build and more folks coming um, to enjoy our time of worship here at Conifer Community Church. Um, Christmas lights coming up. We are setting up October 22nd and October 29th. And so if you would have some time on one of those two Saturdays, we would appreciate the, all the help that we can get. It's uh, you know getting more and more um, laborious to be able to get all of those lights up. And it just takes a lot of, of hours to get those things together, and it's such a blessing to our community. And so um, please, if you can take one or both of those Saturdays and, and spend some time in, in putting those together, all the instructions are there. Um, Donna and Armin will um, help you see how, what all needs to take place for, um, for those things. Um, we've got next Sunday after service, we've got a missions brunch that's coming up, and uh, we get to, get to meet with one of our missionary families who work in Bible translation and hear about all of the great work um, that is happening there and, and the things that have been progressing over the last year or so. Um, and then finally, we have a Halloween outreach coming. Will-O-Wisp is one of the two or three places that everyone goes to trick-or-treat in the mountain community. And so we set up Amy Kronk, who is our children's ministry director, lives right in the heart of, of all of that. And so we go and we set up a, a warming tent so people can stop by and have um, fire pits. And we also um, offer food, hot dogs and, and candy bars, you know, trick-or-treat stuff. And this year we're going to have a photo booth as well for um, those families coming through so that they can take pictures and um, take those home. So we'd love for you to participate if you've got some time on Halloween, October 31st, which is a Monday this year. Um, we'll be out there for a few hours so you can sign up for those. All of those things you can sign up for on the connection card, that orange card. Please drop that and your offering in the box on the back um, on your way out. And um, for those who are online, there is a connection card online that you can fill out there as well. So with that, let's stand together. And our benediction today, may God's grace be with you. And may you find his freedom in your soul. And may you extend the grace that he has given to those around you. May his peace be with you. Amen.